Good afternoon. Come on in, have a seat. We're about to get started. I'm going to lead us all in communal jumping jacks because this is the only way we will all together survive the session. Um, we may have to do that. Um, I'm Gunter Weibel. I'm the director of the digitization program office at the Smithsonian, and I'm joined here by my colleague Vincent Rossi, who's a 3D program officer, and we're here to talk to you about all the beautiful things we have going on at the Smithsonian in terms of digitization. And just in case, that's okay, just in case you're not that familiar with the Smithsonian or you haven't made it down to the mall yet, it's a pretty big place. We have 19 museums, nine research centers, and the National Zoo. Uh, we also have a huge scientific investment with 500 scientists with boots on the ground in 100 country and the collection measures about 138 million objects, most of them actually scientific specimens, about 127 million are in the science realm at the Natural History Museum. Now, when you look at how we provide access to all these collections, um, it's almost a little bit disappointing, I would say. We, when you come and visit us on the National Mall, less than 1% of the collections are actually on display. It's actually far, far less. Um, and when you look at what you can access online, about 2% of the collection are digitized. And by digitized, in this instance, I mean there is some kind of digital image. But please don't imagine the kind of you know, 3D wizardry we will show you in a minute for all of these collections. So it's a bit disappointing, but it's also a huge opportunity because clearly we can do better in bringing these collections to a national and international audience and bringing them to every classroom and living room across the US. So these numbers I just threw out to communicate to you that we're facing tremendous complexity and scale at the Smithsonian. It's a very uh, distributed system. Uh, the Smithsonian operates a little bit like you know, the federal government um, and all the states. So we have um, a central administration as well as all the museums have their own administration. So we face that kind of complexity and we just face the, the daunting numbers that we have. And we don't quite have the resources commensurate with that kind of challenge in terms of digitization. So the formula we fit upon in order to make progress and allow everybody to see what is possible in this kind of a scenario is prototypes, small scale investments that allow us to tell a great story about what we can do. Um, and hopefully that will allow us to get the funding to do a lot more because we've demonstrated to folks that we can do it and that it makes a tremendous difference. And today we're here to talk you through two of those prototypes. Uh, one of them is Smithsonian X3D, and that's what Vince will take the lead on. And then I'll talk you through our rapid capture prototypes, which are more about the traditional side, what I'm going to be forced to call the traditional side of digital imaging with um, digital cameras, um, digital photography. But you'll also see there's nothing traditional about it because we're using things like conveyor belts to digitize collections. Uh, so stay tuned for that. And with that, I'll hand it over to Vince. All right. Thanks, Gunter. Um, so I'm a 3D program officer at the Smithsonian. Um, so if you think about the history of human documentation, the way that we've interpreted our world and studied our world, we've used measurement tools, right? And 3D imaging is essentially a new form of measuring. So instead of traditional point-to-point -point measurement, we might be taking millions or billions of points of measurement to describe an object or an environment. <clears throat> so 3D imaging has largely been developed on the backs of architecture, engineering, um, aerospace, um, architecture. All these worlds have been, have been essentially transformed by 3D technology. And we think that museums um, are poised to go through a similar transformation as this top technology develops and becomes more democratized. So our project, um, what we're calling Smithsonian X3D, is our experiment in using 3D imaging at the Smithsonian. So the Smithsonian, like Gunter explained, not one museum, 19 museums, nine research centers, and we had each one of these 19 museums and nine research centers nominate an object or an archeological site where we can either tell a new story using 3D imaging or solve a, solve a problem. So we've scanned objects like the 1903 Wright Flyer, um, the Abraham Lincoln life masks, and um, collaborated with the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory to take uh, 3D scan data, data of a supernova remnant and deliver that online for people to download and interact with. So when we started this project, there were ways to deliver 3D content online, 
but it wasn't terribly compelling. You would be able to load the model using a WebGL browser, which uh, will load a 3D model without any plugins, but you'd only be able to rotate the object around, and that gets boring in about you know, 10 to 15 seconds. So what we did was we collaborated with Autodesk, um, a software company, to create um, a 3D viewer where we used the 3D models as a storytelling tool, right? So you could jump in and learn about the Abraham Lincoln life masks, um, and we could pull up additional content, and we just sort of click the next button. I'll be demoing that technology in just a bit. And also, importantly, we're making all this data available for download, right? We've all heard about 3D printing, the 3D printing revolution. Um, so 3D printers are available in libraries across the country. Um, they're also, you know, they're showing up in homes. So being able to download that data and be able to sort of take down the walls of the Smithsonian and start to get access to you know, some of the collection objects that people can't even see, right? All the behind the scenes stuff. Being able to download that and bring it into your living room, we think um, has a lot of promise. Um, so the Smithsonian X3D project was made possible with the support of many sponsors, uh, most notably Autodesk and 3D Systems. So this is the team, right? So how does a small team have an impact um, on such a huge institution like the Smithsonian? And Gunter already alluded to the prototypes, right? And that's essentially what Smithsonian X3D was. It was uh, a series of prototypes where we're using 3D technology to support conservation, education, uh, public access. Um, we've also produced a series of videos. So if um, you go to 3d.si.edu, uh, we have, um, I think right now, 12 videos up, and we will have 18 in total in a few months, where you can learn about how 3D is being used in education, um, how it is being used to support conservation, um, and also a number of individual project videos that you could check out. And I'm going to show a quick clip of one of those videos now. 3D in the museum world, in simplest terms, is measurement. Um, Instead of point-to-point -point measurement, like you do with a tape measure or with a pair of calipers, we're taking thousands, millions, or billions of measurements that describe the geometry of an object. 3D technology really affords us the opportunity to see an object from all angles, to tell the entire story of an object, front, back, bottom, top. You can create still renders from that uh, 3D model, you can create video renders, you can even take the geometry and replicate it in physical form using 3D printing technologies or other rapid manufacturing techniques. We've scanned things as small as a euglossine D using micro CT scanning technology, um, and we've also scanned entire archaeological sites in Chile, Indonesia. You can also use X-ray telescopes that can document objects in deep space at an incredibly vast cosmic scale. Of course, most of the Smithsonian collection lies somewhere in between, and that's what we do most of the time. But 3D technology can be defined very broadly, and what you can capture um, surprises us all the time. We want to make sure that any technology we bring in is in service of our mission. So what we've done is we've partnered up with our curators, with researchers, with educators, with conservators, and we've put that technology at their service and we've said, how does this actually further your day-to-day -day work? And we've created an amazing array of use cases that actually showcase that in all these areas, 3D makes a tremendous impact and can allow people to do more of the things they're already striving to do. Okay, so I'm going to talk quickly about two of those use cases. Um, first, we're going to start at the American History Museum, um, the Gunboat Philadelphia. So the Gunboat Philadelphia was built in 1776 and sunk that same year, um, and it was remarkably well preserved um, on the bottom of Lake Champlain. So because of the cold waters, um, it was pulled up in almost one piece. We see it being pulled up here. Um, it's an enormous vessel. This, this object represents the beginning of America's Navy. Um, it's about 50 feet long. The American History Museum was actually built around this object. You can see it being hoisted in there. So over time, sort of the walls sort of encroached on this object, right? This is an iconic <laughs> object, and now you can only see it from two vantage points, right? From the front and sort of from the side with a little catwalk there. So we thought that that, that you know, because of the, the limited line of sight issues here, that we could use 3D technology and let people see this object from all sides. That's something you cannot see um, in the gallery at the museum. So here's the raw data. We used a laser scanner that was designed to scan entire buildings. Um, so we scanned the entire gunboat. 
and here we have uh, the model. So now we're able to sort of spin it around and the, uh, the curators, any visitor, anyone who goes to 3d.si.edu can now rotate this model around. So we're sort of solving a public access problem, but at the same time, we're also supporting uh, preservation. So we've also done some extremely high resolution 3D scans of sections of this boat. And we're gonna come back every two to three years and rescan those areas, because it's actually deteriorating. It's sort of flaking the side, the, the pieces of the boat are actually flaking off due to a nylon treatment that um, I think was done in the 1970s. So now we can use 3D scanning technology, a deviation analysis, overlay those two scans, and monitor degradation over time. Now I'm gonna jump into one of our, our field site projects. Um, we partnered with the National, Ge or National Geographic and the Chilean National Museum, along with the Natural History Museum. So they're widening the Pan American Highway in 2011 and they uncovered over 40 complete fossil whale specimens. So this is a remarkable find um, in the area of about the size of two football fields. So with um, only a few weeks notice, we were able to respond. Um, they had halted construction for research to be done, but normally for each one of these fossils, and each one is about 30 feet long, um, it would take you know two to three months to properly excavate. So in this situation, um, the paleontologists were actually having to pull these out of the ground every two weeks. So we had five days on site, we slept in the desert, we, we started 3D scanning. Um, the original or the traditional method of documentation, which hasn't changed for hundreds of years, is drawing a meter by meter string line and sketching the approximate location of each fossil in the ground. So using 3D scanning tools, we were able to take that level of documentation much, much further. So this specimen in particular, you know, we probably collected over a billion um, accurate measurement points that describe the surface of this object. And that's my colleague, Adam Metalla. Um, and I'm using a, um, this, is the, this is the scanner used for um, architecture. So I can scan an object anywhere from three all the way out to 70 meters. So I'm getting all that contextual information and how these um, whales relate to each other spatially. So all of the fossils have been saved. None of them were destroyed, but they're encased in plaster jacket and literally, literally tons of rock. Right, so that's, they're not gonna be accessible for probably decades. Um, the data we collected within five days from being back in the field, we were able to create 3D prints. Um, and most importantly, it's the data itself, right? With the data itself, we can do things like one-click volume calculation, surface area, very accurate measurements. Um, and a research paper was published um, in the Royal Society by Dr. Nicholas P Pineson. Um, and they actually made us co-authors, which was really surprising. And, for, for the technical guys to be a part of that. Um, here we are also, so we're supporting research at the Smithsonian and fundamentally, you know, that's what happens at the Smithsonian. It's a research institution. At the same time, of course, we have exhibits. Um, so while research was going on, we partnered with 3D Systems and Ping Fu um, in the center of this picture is the vice president of 3D Systems. Um, they helped us create that 3D print, which now hangs in the wall of the Natural History Museum. So for those of you who are familiar with 3D printing, this is sort of a, a big 3D print. So a 3D print that's 20 feet long and six foot wide is pretty, pretty remarkable. And we did that with the support of 3D systems again. Quick making of video. So it wasn't printed all in one piece. It was 40 individual tiles that were tiled together. And then of course there was some seaming done. And then it was also um, painted by hand. So that's something that is not computer numeric controlled yet. <laughs> <clears throat> so I'm gonna switch out and do a quick live demo here and show you the 3D viewer. Okay, so here we are at 3D.si.edu. And we're gonna go through a, a tour of the 1903 Wright Flyer that we scanned. And this tour is led by Dr. Peter Jacob who is one of the world's experts on the 1903 Wright Flyer at the Air and Space Museum. So I'm gonna simply click the next button and we're gonna get walk through, you know, we can zoom into different areas, we can do cross sections, we can do cutaways, we can show measurements, and we have this text panel that comes up on the right and gives us additional information. So it's almost like the next generation of PowerPoint, right? Only we're using a 3D model as sort of the scaffolding to tell the story. Um, and of course, we can make use of other digitized content as well whether that's imagery, video, um, or audio. So right now, um, our team creates these tours. What we'd really like to do with this is be able to um, 
let anyone create these tours, right? Whereas, you know, a school teacher who's interested in the right flyer or the Abraham Lincoln life masks, they can create a lesson plan using this tool. So that's not something we could do yet, but that's something we, we sort of see as a next step. Next, I'm gonna jump over. This is a object from the Freer Sackler Gallery. It's the Cosmological Buddha. And it has low relief carving all over this object. So I'm gonna zoom in so you can see some of that. But the stone texture um, sort of competes with that low relief. And also the 500 word text panel that's in the gallery with this object does not come close to telling the complete story of this object. This is the references Buddhist scripture, and it describes uh, Buddha's journey towards enlightenment, um, starting from the bottom of the robe all the way up to the top on all sides. And this is pretty much what the object looks like in the gallery. So we're able to do a few things here. Uh, let's see. I need to get full screen first. Okay, there we go. So I can turn off the photo texture, right? And we can look, this is the raw geometry. This is still a faithful representation of the object. And then we can play around with the ambient occlusion maps and we could pull out a lot more detail. So, and this actually was really useful for the curator, um, Dr. Keith Wilson, to, he was able to see things that he wasn't able to see with the actual object itself. Now, Again, we're not, we're not modifying this data. Ambient occlusion maps are essentially increasing, um, well, air, area of high curvature gets dark, and area of low curvature, flat areas get lighter. Question? Do you want the question at the end? Sorry? Oh, we could, whatever. Well, so, so are you routinely uh, providing textures? Sorry? Are you routinely uh, also uh, providing textures for these objects? Yeah, I mean, for the uh, uh, for the uh, it depends on the method of capture. Um, in some cases, We've scanned the object using photogrammetry, whereas there, there would be texture, but if we only had laser scan data or we only had CT data, generally that there is no texture. Um, there are ways to combine that. We have combined it in the past, but it's a very manual process. And then I'll show you one more thing. So we're able to turn on this hotspot area, and then we could also just navigate this object freely on our own and we can click on these regions and find out more about these regions. And this is the tool that uh, the curator used uh, the most. And now he can simply, you know, if he wants to share this object or notations with colleagues around the world, and he has, he can um, take a measurement or zoom into an area and whenever we click the share button, a unique URL is generated and we can copy and paste that into another browser and whoever opens that URL goes exactly to the same view and sees exactly what you're seeing. Um, another functionality we built in here is uh, that we can take this and embed it. So we can embed the 3D viewer the same way we would embed a YouTube video. So we can copy and paste this. Anyone can put this in their blog or website. Uh, so it's extremely shareable. Yes? Is the viewer open source available? Uh, right now, the viewer is not open source. It's owned between the Smithsonian and Autodesk. Cosmological Buddha, we've already done. So the public perception um, was 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 pretty good and we were excited about that. Um, and here we have, um, you know, we, I, we suspect a teenager judging by the language that he's using here. Um, but he took the woolly mammoth, he downloaded it, he put it in Cinema 4D, which is a 3D modeling package, and he was creating his own renderings, right? Now of course this is research, but it's a cool use, right? People are downloading this stuff and they're doing unexpected things uh, with the data itself. And that's, that's exciting for us and our team. Um, Let's see, so um, in Houston, they actually took the 3D models. So d during the 150th anniversary of the Gettysburg Address, um, a college in Houston took the 3D models of uh, Abraham Lincoln life masks, and they printed them out and they put them on display. And this is also very, very exciting for us. And you can imagine, right now, we have dozens of models that you could download online. Once we have thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of models online, we can imagine how this could be happening 
uh, all over the world with many different museums. Um, so you could download all of our content for free online. Yes? So with that plan, would they all be work like STLs where you're French? Um, that's a really good question. Um, in some cases, we always strive to provide watertight STLs. Um, in some cases, that might be really difficult. The Gunboat Philadelphia is an example because it's extremely complex geometry, and we would probably have to have you know, an expert modeler spending you know, four weeks getting that watertight. But in general, our, we strive to create watertight models and export and make them available. Um, now, while 3D printing has been democratized, What's also great is that you know, we're able to use the 3D viewer and people can actually access this with their computer and an internet connection. I'm gonna skip ahead here because I'm running a little bit behind. Adam Savage of Mythbusters tweeted out to us. We just want to, I'm really proud of that. And most recently, um, we, we worked to 3D scan um, President Barack Obama to create the first uh, 3D scanned and printed presidential portrait. And here you can see that there's a limit in the resolution of the actual 3D print, but the data that we captured probably cannot be replicated at full resolution for another 10 years. And I'll play a short video. Uh, can tell that will, they can see it. Oh yeah, you should totally go see it at the natural <laughs> at, at the Smithsonian Castle. Where is it at? At the Smithsonian Castle, so it's um, right on the mall. It's not at the portrait gallery. It, actually, it is going to the portrait oh, gallery. Okay. It will, it's not accessioned yet, but it will be accessioned into the portrait, portrait gallery um, permanent collection. We're here at the White House working with the Smithsonian Institution on creating a 3D presidential portrait. And the system that we've brought to be part of this process is called our mobile light stage. It's uh, right over there and we're setting it up right now so that it can be used to record almost certainly the highest resolution digital model that's ever been made of a head of state. The inspiration for the project of creating a 3D portrait of President Obama really comes from the Lincoln Life Mask in our National Portrait Gallery. And I have a Lincoln Life Mask with me today, and they're called Life Masks because these were directly taken from his likeness. So there was plaster put on his face, uh, there were two little holes poked where the nostrils were so he could still breathe, and seeing that made us think, what would have happened if we could actually do that with a sitting president? using modern day technologies and tools to create a similarly authentic experience that connects us to history, to connects us to a moment in time, and connects us to a person's likeness. So the process should go relatively quickly. We will uh, invite the president to sit down. He will be uh, surrounded in front by 50 custom-built LED lights, eight high-resolution sports photography cameras and an additional six wider-angle cameras. Uh, in about one second, as he holds his presidential pose, he will be illuminated by ten different lighting conditions, which will change the polarization of the light, the directionality of the light, and will give us everything that we need to understand the shape of his face and how it transforms incident illumination into the images that we see of him. Ten years ago, it was just barely possible to think this could be done. So here we have a structured light 3D scanner, and we're using this to scan the president. They're handheld. They're flashing a fringe pattern of light. And there are stereo cameras recording how that fringe pattern forms over geometry, or in this case, the president's face. The president getting his uh, likeness scanned, uh, as cool as that is, is also about a broader trend that's going on, and that is the third industrial revolution. It's the combination of the digital world and the physical world that is allowing uh, students and entrepreneurs to be able to go from idea to prototype in the blink of an eye. It's been a few days since we've uh, 3D scanned the president, and we're looking at some raw data on screen right here. So this is the data that came out of the handheld scanners that Adam Mattel and I were, were using to scan the president. This is the first uh, bust that's created a head of state from objective 3D scan data. So this isn't an artistic likeness of the president. This is actually uh, millions upon millions of measurements that create a 3D likeness of the president that we can now 3D print and make something that's never been done before. And uh, the, the capture and the creation of the bust was also uh, made in support with uh, 
the support from Autodesk and also 3D Systems as well. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to pass it back to Gunter. Well, how do you follow up on that? This is going to be really tricky. No more presidents now. <laughs> Just boring stuff. Sorry. Rapid capture of collections, photography, you know, that kind of stuff, bread and butter. Actually, it does get a little bit more exciting than that. So what we've done in terms of, again, what I'm now forced to call traditional photography of collections is we've organized one-week prototypes uh, that help us get everybody on the same page and understand what impact we can make if we have a dedicated workforce, we have well-thought-out workflows, and we put our all of those resources to the task of digitization. Um, we also do that in a sort of quote-unquote Smithsonian public way. We have people stop by, see those uh, rapid capture pilots. Um, we have over 150 staff members uh, stopping by for each one of those. And what these one-week pilots do is they really allow us to work through all the issues that are standing in the way of scaling up digitization to sort of a, the kind of way that a lot of you are used to in a library setting where you have specialized equipment, uh, very high throughput rates when you're digitizing um, book collections in particular. And so what we've been able to do so far is um, when we're done, we're done. When we're done um, with the capture, we also have the materials managed. All the data automatically flows into our digital asset management system at the Smithsonian. This is an example from a glass plate of, of a, from a rapid capture pilot capturing glass plate negatives in the Smithsonian Gardens collections. When we are done, uh, we have all the digital images synced up with our collections information systems, so that happens automatically behind the scenes. This is an example from our uh, rapid capture pilot at the Freer Sackler capturing ceramics, so we're also doing photography of three-dimensional objects very, very fast now. Uh, when we're done, the objects are online. Um, Here's an example of, who can guess who that is? It is James Brown howling publicly now um, on the Smithsonian Collection Search Center. Uh, this is the pilot from African American History and Culture. And when we're done, the data also can flow, if appropriate, automatically to the Smithsonian Transcription Center, which is a fairly new website we have where we have, can engage digital volunteers in transcribing information, for example, here of historic paper currency that was printed before the Civil War that has a lot of information on it, you know, which municipality printed this currency, who signed off on it, what denomination is it, and so on and so forth. And it's all information we currently don't have in our collections information systems. So all of this happens uh, within almost instantaneously now. Uh, it used to take us, you know, weeks and months and sometimes years in order to finish up these projects. You know, somebody would do the digitization and somebody would upload it into the asset management system. Eventually, somehow it would get into the collections information systems. We now do that instantaneously. When stuff gets captured, it automatically flows into all these systems. And the reason we can do that is that we've thought very hard both about the physical workflow as well as the digital workflow. And I'm not going to go into the detail here, but what you see, the red arrows are the physical workflow, which is highly dependent on barcoding. So that's how we can track everything. This is um, our way of optimizing how things move from the collection storage area to the camera and move away again. And then when it gets to the green arrows, you can see how the data flows between our systems. And for, in many instances, that's now completely automated. In some instances, it's still a little bit clunky, but we're we're getting there. And what we could prove with these one-week pilots is that we can do um, about 40,000 items a year for three-dimensional objects, uh, you know, the ceramics. Um, and we can do well over 100,000 items for things that are a little simpler to handle, like the photo photographs or um, the historic paper currency. And we can go from the shelf to the public in less than 24 hours. Somebody picks up the item, and because we've integrated the back of the house, uh, stuff moves up to the public really, really fast. Uh, in a museum setting, that is unheard of. I've never heard a museum do that before. This is also not just sort of getting the, the work done. This is also an exercise of winning the hearts and minds and trying to spread the word uh, Smithsonian internally about what we can do and how, co how efficiently and cost efficiently we can work. 
And we're always trying to look for fun ways to communicate that. The open houses, the rapid capture pilots are one way to do that, where staff can really see it and you know, can, can ask the folks who are doing the work. Uh, and we thought another cool way to communicate it would be to write a comic book, so we did. So you can download this, it's online, and it's a little comic book that basically talks about, um, in a fun way, about how these rapid capture pilots work and what all uh, the things are that go into uh, making them happen. So check that out, it's on the uh, dpo.si.edu website, go to the blog and you'll find it there. Um, but we're now moving beyond the prototypes. Uh, we also thought, okay, one doing something for one week, that's one thing, can we do it for eight weeks? Because we're trying to work our way up to, of course, doing these things year round. And we had an eight-week pilot at the National Museum of Natural History in the entomology department capturing bumblebees. And we managed to do an entire collection of bumblebees, 45,000 bumblebees in eight weeks, which is unheard of and a tremendous <coughs> speed because you have to think about when you want to digitize one of those bumblebees, they have to get unpinned the label that's below that bumblebee that does not exist in any database needs to be pulled off of the pin, needs to be laid next to the bee, just like you see here, and that package needs to then go to the digitization station. So we had, um, at the peak, seven individuals unpinning and repinning those labels and prepping each individual bee to go to the digitization station. Uh, here's uh, Secretary uh, Wayne G. Clough getting a tour of that uh, pilot and getting uh, detailed instructions on how to do that unpinning and repinning, which takes some expertise. Um, so we got a good bit of uh, institutional traction here also with senior leadership who were very impressed with the speeds at which we could move. But we can even do better than that. So at the numismatics collection, we did a pilot project just with people moving the, this historic paper currency. And we showed that we can do about 120,000 items a year that way. But we've got 260,000 items in that collection. And we wanted to move even faster. So historically, that collection was scanned using a flatbed scanner. And if you do the math on that, it would take about 20 years if somebody worked actually 24 hours a day on that. So that seems kind of unacceptable. <laughs> then when we did the rapid capture pilot, uh, we hit throughput speeds that allowed us to extrapolate that we could finish in about two years at the cost of $7 per item. That seems a lot more acceptable. But we can even do better than that. And this is, by the way, uh, our um, Undersecretary for History, Art, and Culture. We pressed him into service here. So we had an expert crew working this project. <laughs> But we can do even better than that. We now brought a conveyor belt that was used in the, in the Netherlands to digitize um, the natural history collections at Naturalis. And we are using it to digitize this collection. So now we will be done, finished, with a collection of 260,000 items in three to four months. And it'll cost us a little less than a dollar an item. So that's an incredible increase in throughput as well as cost effectiveness in the time span of 10 months. Uh, is what we figured that out. And this is just a little sneak peek. So this is running right now on the National Mall at American History. This is where the currency comes off the conveyor belt. So this video is sort of going backwards. You can see the operator looking at the screen. There's automatic quality control that happens. So this, every single image gets checked against the, fa uh, the FAGI guidelines uh, because you can see they're capturing um, a target here alongside uh, the currency, the camera shoots every time it senses that there's actually an object there. So if there were no object there, because the operator on the other hand sort of maybe lost their stride, no image gets taken. So it's an incredibly sophisticated system. The conveyor moves every time somebody on the other end actually takes an object off, so it doesn't move auto autonomously. And um, at this point, it moves every five seconds. So we digitize the an image every five seconds. Uh, this system is single-sided capture, yeah. So you'd have to run it through again in order to get the other side. But there's nothing of scientific merit on the other side of these objects. We always check that with, this, with the curators. We also make sure that the resolution is appropriate. We look at things under a microscope to determine what the smallest level of detail is we need to capture. 
Uh, in this instance, it's sort of the final plan of the engraving, and then we make sure we pick the appropriate resolution. Uh, this system runs at uh, 700 ppi. What, how much of a footprint do you think that We managed to jam that into the <laughs> into uh, the library space here uh, in the front room of the numismatics collection. I actually don't know off the top of my head. I like think just like like that page, twice that table. It's probably from here to the door, and it's very very narrow. It's not not even as wide as to the front row of the chairs. But it's really jammed in there. I wouldn't recommend doing it like that. But <laughs> <laughs> not much of a choice. But that's yeah, because what is on the other side there is the vault. So there's a locked vault there that is very high security uh, where all this material exists. So we, you know, we didn't want to carry that down the hallways. They had to shorten that conveyor belt in order to jam it in there. And then for the throughput, is the, is the operator at the beginning controlling the throughput? What happens if the woman at the end, I can see this, Charlie Chaplin kind of right. thing where the stuff comes on the conveyor belt and you can't keep up. How do you deal with that? So remember, that person right there, when he takes it off, the conveyor belt knows that he's taken it off because there's a sensor, and that's when it moves. And only then, if he, if he didn't take this off, this item, conveyor would sit there. So it does not move auto autonomously. It only moves when something comes off. So nothing ever falls off because there's all those sensors in the conveyor. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. So these things currently do not have any records at all in the collections information systems. So once the images get taken, they get attended to a, to a bulk record and that's the first time they've had a unique record, then they get uploaded to the transcription center, and then the unique metadata for each of the items gets created by the digital volunteers. So they have to, they have to now churn through all of that. Yeah. But all of that is automated. All that uploading that's all part of the system um, and the uploading into our asset management system, all of that is automated. So as soon as the item comes off the conveyor belt, for all intents and purposes, all of that's already done. There's nothing, nothing left. Do you have a record? We haven't done that yet. There's a, another type of technology we could use for that that this particular vendor has uh, that looks differently. Right, and that's, that's the carousel, yeah. But for this, again, we didn't need that. Okay, one more question. I assume you're digitally registering the object, so that it appears square is a lot yeah, so what, what happens is the, the, it gets shot the way it sits there, and then it automatically gets deskewed and cropped. That's all part of the software. So again, that's not a manual process. And do you have any problem that the surface is not totally horizontal? That it's not totally plain, you mean? If there's any buckling, is that what you're right. referring to? So th th um, that's also part of the testing we make, you know, because nothing is ever perfectly plain, we make sure that we have that kind of enough depth of field. But for this specific collection, it's not a huge issue uh, because for all intents and purposes, it is as plain as it gets. But if we did the bees, for example, with this system, which we could in theory, it's a very different game because you need a lot more depth of field. And we would just, the camera would be set up specifically for that. Uh, it's, it's actually each setup for the conveyor belt uh, has a custom lens configuration that's specifically created for the kind of depth of field as well as the kind of resolution the requirements require. Sure. So now we're, so all the projects I've talked to you about so far are quote unquote simple in the sense that they have one specific type of collection object they're targeting. You know, whether it's a B or whether it's this historic paper currency, it's all the same stuff and then we do the same thing over and over and over again. So here's what happens when, you have, when you're trying to digitize an entire museum in one fell project. Uh, so that's what the Cooper Hewitt asked us to do. It's a collection that's up in New York. It belongs to the, it's a part of the Smithsonian. 
Um, and it is a very varied collection. It's a design collection. I've pulled out some of the different types of materials you'd encounter. But you know, you'd encounter anything from a, from a, now it's getting warm. Uh, <laughs> from a, you know, from flat objects like prints to chairs to uh, vases, uh, anything that's in, uh, that you might imagine encountering in the design collection is there. So we are now uh, starting to digitize that collection in its entirety. We're projecting it'll take us probably 18 to 24 months. Uh, the conveyor belt will go up to New York and do part of the uh, job as well. We have five different pipelines running. So we have basically five different setups that different types of collection objects then get routed to and get shot on. And um, the cost might go up a little bit from the $7 per object that I've projected here, but it's in that vicinity. Um, and I think it's uh, literally us putting all the knowledge that we've acquired in the pilot projects to use and putting it all together now for one, one big project that tries to wrap its arms around an entire museum. So watch us fail. This has obviously just started, so I can't tell you whether we'll succeed or not, but this is, this is the plan. And last but not least, I want to circle back to the 3D story that Vince told you. So for 2D, uh, for traditional photography, we're in pretty good shape with scaling up because it's kind of, it's a known art, quote unquote. Well, you know, you all have been doing it for a long time in a museum setting. Uh, museums have started to do it. So there's a lot of expertise there and a lot of knowledge. In the 3D world, it's a completely new game and we're just starting to try to figure out how to move really fast for 3D as well. And we were ch challenged to do that um, by this guy. This is the nation's T-Rex, or a represent representation thereof, which came to the Smithsonian earlier this year. And it didn't come as a fully assembled T-Rex. Of course, it came bone by bone by bone, so it's over 200 bones. And we uh, 3D scanned every single one of those bones in a public setting, so the, the public could come in and watch that. And that really required a, a deep look at our workflows, at how to uh, try to move as fast as possible and as safely as possible for the specimen doing that. Um, and the reason why we're doing this is because the 3D data will then help the, the curators to decide how the T-Rex will be posed because they can experiment putting the bones together, which you can't do with physical bones because let me tell you, a pelvis of a T-Rex is something mighty heavy and you need like five people to move it. <laughs> so you, you don't want to play with the actual bones. If you can do it in a digital way, that's vastly preferable. So eventually um, the T-Rex will come to a 3D printer near you where we haven't launched it yet online, but we will and it'll be accessible just like all our other objects uh, for educational, personal, non-commercial use and we'll make the underlying data available. There now also, there's also a conveyor belt system for 3D digitization, which you may have heard about. It's built by the Fraunhofer Institute in Germany, and Adam and Vince actually traveled to a test of it in Frankfurt and took a, a closer look at it. And I'll have a brief video that shows you a prototype of it. And again, the idea is here being can we make this a lot faster? And actually the magic for making 3D capture faster isn't necessarily in a career, but it's more in the idea that you can automate the first process. You know, we, we can capture an object of you know, reasonable size sometimes in an hour if it's a simple like device. But if it's really complex like the right wire, it might take us three days. But then you have weeks or months of post-processing looking at solutions that can automate the post-processing for these 3D models uh, and can help us move faster from that perspective. And that's what we have for you today. All right. I think with that, thanks for heating up the room.